Heard all about when love breaks down from Patty and Mac Just never thought that it Feel so ashamed by those tears drawn to your eyes. They say much more than any of my replies. So much more than any sentence of mine could ever sum. the same as before down from Patty and Mac Just never thought that it'd be like this The feeling of your loveless kiss And my heart hearted and But 
Feel so ashamed by those tears drawn to your eyes. They say much more than any of my replies. So much more than any sentence of mine could ever sum. But no matter what you say, I still sigh anyway. And all those things that made you laugh now only make you cry. Baby, maybe it's not the same anymore. I guess it's not the same as before. the same as before
Roger Chibenu est un compositeur finlandais. Air est un groupe de musique français originaire de Versailles formé en 1995 composé de Jean Benoît, Duncan et de Nicolas Gobin. Rika Virgin est une chanson de l'artiste américaine Madonna qui figure sur son deuxième album du... Finlandais. Air est un groupe de musique français originaire de Versailles formé en 1995 composé de Jean Benoît, Duncan et de Nicolas Gobin. Rika Virgin est une chanson de l'artiste américaine Madonna qui figure sur son deuxième album du...
Hirn und Hände wollen zusammenkommen. Aber es fehlt ihnen das Herz dazu. Mittler zwischen Hirn und Händen muss das Herz sein.
about when love breaks down from Patty and Macaulay. Just never thought that it'd be like this. The feeling of your love. And my heart hearted and breaks. But no matter what you say, I still sigh anyway. And all those things that made you laugh now only make. the same as before I feel so ashamed by those tears drawn to They say much more than any of my replies. So much more than any sentence of mine could ever summarize. But no. I still sigh anyway And all those things that made you laugh Now only make you cry Baby Maybe It's not the same anymore I guess it's not the same as before the same as before Heard all about when love breaks down from Patty and Magdalene. Just never thought that it. And my heart hearted and breaks. But no matter what you say, I still sigh anyway. And all those things that made you laugh now only make. the same as before I feel
feel so ashamed by those tears drawn to your eyes. They say much more than any of my replies. So much more than any sentence of mine could ever the same as before
Finlandais. Père est un groupe de musique français originaire de Versailles formé en 1995 composé de Jean Benoît, Nocken et de Nicolas Gobin. Rika Virgin est une chanson de l'artiste américaine Madonna qui figure sur son deuxième album du... Finlandais. Air est un groupe de musique français originaire de Versailles formé en 1995 composé de Jean Benoît, Nocken et de Nicolas Gobin. Rika Virgin est une chanson de l'artiste américaine Madonna qui figure sur son deuxième album du... To connect. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's green. Do you hear it? Yeah. Oh, ho, ho. should I redo maybe? Yeah, yeah. Let, let's imagine th this. <coughs> the last five minutes didn't happen. <coughs> well, hello and welcome to <laughs> uh, this nice contentful meetup at uh, Futurist uh, in Stockholm. So, uh, just a quick introduction of Futurists. Um, we're a uh, 
consultancy company doing both design and development and trying to be as multidisciplinary as we can. So we try to uh, do both uh, design and tech together and working closely in like tightly knit teams. Uh, we have been using Contentful in quite a few um, projects, so we're very happy to host this uh, event this evening. Um, yeah, and without further ado, <laughs> let me introduce <laughs> Reuven. <laughs> so let me switch this out. I should probably wear this. Yep. Yeah, okay, let's do it from this. is the last slide, not the first one. <laughs> Yes, let's do it from my left. That's a nice plan. Let me look like I did this about contact with reality. So this goes here. All right, can everybody hear me? Cool, but nobody can see my screen. Yes, people can see my screen now. Wonderful. And let's shift this over to actually be on the screen. All right. Hi, welcome to our seventh meetup in Stockholm. And thank you very much for Futurist for hosting. My name is Ruven. Um, I'm one of Contentful's developer evangelists. Um, I'm based in our Berlin office, um, which is the Contentful HQ. Um, we originally have an office in San Francisco. And we have some people strewn around around the world. Um, before we start the talks, a couple of quick notes. First one, agenda. Um, first, yours truly, um, we'll be talking about content testing and deployment. We'll see in a minute what that means. And then Robin from Futurist uh, will be talking about how to get started with UI extensions. We're always looking for speakers um, at these meetups. We host them every quarter. And it shouldn't just be me talking at every one of them. Um, I want to see all of you speaking. If you build something cool, if you learn something cool, if you failed somehow, um, share those stories. Help the rest of the community to learn from your wisdom or from your failures. I love hearing failure stories. They're always amusing. Um, so don't be shy. Um, come either approach me afterwards or go to this link, contentful.com slash become a speaker. Um, or share, an e share your email with me. I'll put you in touch with Martin. Um, I would love to see you stand here. And then really quick note before I start with the talk. Um, we have a community code of conduct. Um, I don't want to go into all the details of it. If you are interested in them, they are available after this link. The show is just be excellent to each other. It is a professional environment. Don't be rowdy. Don't be insulting. Don't be disgusting. Um, just be nice to each other. All right. With that out of the way. Thanks, it works. It's amazing. It's amazing what it does. Let me shift this over here, and I get my preview here. All right, content testing and deployment done the right way. That implies there's a wrong way. We'll talk about that in a minute, too. First, um, I'm going to reintroduce myself uh, because I love hearing my name so much. My name is Ruben. I'm a developer evangelist. I love APIs. I also love whiskey and cake. If you want to gain favors with me, those are the two main ways you can do that. The other one is by speaking here. Um, so come and speak. All right. Um, I want to talk about content. But since we are all developers and we're talking about Contentful, I want to talk about content in the context of software. And building software is really hard. And in fact, it's so hard, nobody gets it right the first time. Um, whoever has created something, deployed it, and it just worked the first try. No debugging necessary, no syntax error, nothing. Huh? Anybody? No, I thought so. It's just really, really hard. And when you can't have perfection, the next best thing is change and making change easy. So you need to be able to iterate on things with very little effort and cost. And what that really means is don't make change in production. We just said, like, we're all not perfect. We all make mistakes. We all fail regularly because building software is hard. So why would we build things in production? That's a really, really bad idea. So no matter what your boss says, don't make changes in production. It's a really bad idea. So if I talk about Contentful and making changes, I don't really mean content changes. Content changes are not building software. 
but there's something else in Contentful that you make changes to, and that's your content model. And we released, um, about one and a half years ago, the Contentful Migration CLI. Who has used it? Uh, about half, all right. So quick review what the Migration CLI can do. Um, you can create content types, you can delete content types, you can edit content types, you can create, edit, and delete fields in content types, and you can change field IDs. And how you do that is not through the web app, but to JavaScript. So we have a little uh, SDK, a little uh, domain-specific language, essentially, um, where you write your changes to your content model as code, and then you execute it via the Contentful CLI. So you have programmatic content model changes as opposed to manual content model changes. Advantage, it's repeatable. Um, you can't just execute it once, you execute it over and over and over again, which is really, really useful when you need to debug things. If something goes wrong the first time and you can't execute it a second time, it's not so good. You can keep it in version control. Um, you want to know what Bob did three weeks ago that broke production after the fact, and you just had terrible logging, so you didn't know until right now, but what was the change he made? His memory isn't always that good, so he doesn't remember what he did three weeks ago. Maybe he was on vacation for two weeks in between, forgot everything that happened before. So having version control to review what happened, maybe with some comments, commit messages, explaining the context is really helpful. We can run sanity checks on it. Uh, does this change even make sense given the current state of the space? And, and this is the really cool part, we can actually stop applying them manually. We can have our continuous integration servers apply them for us. And this is really powerful because at this point, I don't have to hand out admin permissions to everybody on the team just so they can evolve the content model. I can just force them to check them into Git where everybody can see them and have the CI server apply them and then do the testing. So really quick demo of how this works. So you have a little migration field uh, file. This one creates a field called movies. Um, and now we're gonna execute that file with the contentful CLI and the migration command in the space with this ID using this token. Don't worry, this token is revoked. Can't do anything with it. Yes, some people try things. So this is the sanity check. Uh, very much it just tells you, this is the thing I'm gonna to do. Are you sure you wanna do this? Um, also at this point, the server checked if, uh, the CLI checked, does this migration make sense given the storm state of the content model? If the content type post wasn't existing, it would have bailed out at this point saying, this is an impossible migration, you're making a mistake here. So, that's nice, um, but that still doesn't really allow me to test things because one if one to discard test of preview migration. All this still runs on my master sp space, it's in production, um, and cloning a space is a lot of effort. You can do it with the export and import tool. Um, if you have a small space, that's fine. Um, we have spaces with several hundred thousand of entries. It's not so much fun anymore. So that's a little uncool. So the solution for that problem we have, space environments. Space environments allow you to create multiple versions of a space. We call them sandbox environments. And change them in isolation. So you take your master environment, which is always the one that should serve production. And with the click of a few buttons, you just make a complete clone of the space. So right now, you probably have some code like this in your code base if you use JavaScript. You initialize the client um, with a space ID and an API key. You can actually enhance this by also specifying an environment. So you can run your migration on an environment and test your code using that environment. And you're completely isolated from your production environment. You can also combine this with the migration CLIs. So the migration CLI doesn't just take a space and an access token, it also takes an environment. So like this migration file, I want to apply to this specific environment because I want to test it. So common uses for space environments. Local development. I want to try something new. I want to have a new content type. 
or I want to remove a field um, and I want to make the code change for it. So I'm just going to make myself an environment to work locally. You probably want to have a dedicated environment for your staging or QA server. Um, you might want to have the upcoming version. If you have a staging branch, you want to keep that in sync with the content model in a staging environment. Um, continuous integration, and that's what I want to talk a bit more about. So, continuous integration, who here uses it? Let's start this way. One, two, three, a third of the room, now I'm concerned. <laughs> Everybody else just runs the test locally or you don't test? Okay, nobody wants to admit it, that's fine. <laughs> um, if you don't test, be ashamed, go home and learn unit testing um, or integration testing. So what does a simple continuous integration pipeline look like? Generally, it involves these steps. Build, test, and deploy. But now, let's see how would migrations fit into this. You would still build, but then you would create a new environment. You would apply the migrations for, to this new environment. Then you run your tests, and then you deploy. And deploying involves applying the same migrations to the master event environment. So the migration file travels along with the code changes. Um, we did a little demo in CircleCI for this. This is what um, this looks like. You see here, um, whoops, preparing environment for testing. That's the magic line. Um, oops. So you build and test, and then you have a different deployment task that updates the master environment. So this is the very important part about this. Your intention is always to keep your content model in sync with your code. And nobody's listening to me because the GIF is so awesome. It's great. <laughs> so yeah, apparently you can, um, shoot, what is it called in English when you're with your handbrake drifting? You can drift with trains. Um, I want to find a video of somebody doing it with real trains instead of model trains. I haven't found that yet. Um, but yeah, apparently you can drift trains. Um, so if you do this and you think about not just having one environment at a time, your staging environment, but you have a big development team and you don't want to be constrained to, okay, only one person is allowed to work on the content model this week. Um, next week it's your turn. Um, you want to work in parallel but you still need some coordination mechanism um, because content model changes might conflict. And unlike Git, there is no conflict resolution mechanism because it involves migrating a lot of data. You're not just, you're evolving the schema itself, not the data. So what we propose is to version your content model and to have a simple content type you call version tracking with a single field called version it just contains a number. Start at one, one is what you have right now, and every time you apply a change, you just increment it. So you still need to deploy those in order, but you can write your code so it bails out when you go out of sequence. Um, if you suddenly try to short circuit and apply content model number seven, when your mass is only at five, just bail out. It's the manual way of conflict resolution. So when you have this content type, you have a single entry, um, and this entry contains this information. Then have a magic folder in your repository you call migrations. And these migrations have the same numbers. 1JS, 2JS, 3JS, 4JS, 550,783JS. As much as you want, just takes longer. And you set up CircleCI. CircleCI has really powerful configuration. You can play with variables a lot. Um, this, by the way, is available online if you want to base um, your own um, workflow on this. If you use CircleCI, we have it available as a Git repository and we have a tutorial written up on it. Um, so you run um, a custom script um, to run these migrations. And, and this is very important, you need to make sure that all your tests that you run are environment aware. So every time you call the contentful client, you need to be able to extract out into an environment variable or a command that you can invoke or something. Um, so it's like, hey, this needs to run against this contentful environment. Because if you start assuming you're always running on master, and master doesn't keep up with the changes, you're not um, actually testing what you want to test. So let's look, stick into the migrate.js file that you saw earlier. Um, we're gonna 
use the contentful management client, the JavaScript client here. And first, we just set it up with the um, access token as a space. Next, we check, does this environment exist already? Then we create the environment if it doesn't yet exist. Important step, we allow the API key we currently use to actually access that environment. API keys need to be whitelisted for environments. If you create a new environment, no API key you currently have actually has access to this environment. And then, and this is the magic part, um, we check which migrations actually need to run. This can't, that doesn't have to be just one file. You can also run multiple migration files. Let's see what this looks like. This is very small, so I'm gonna try to make this a little bit bigger, which is difficult. Hmm, how do I make this bigger the easiest way? Nope, okay, um, I can't make this bigger, so I'm just gonna talk along. Um, so this is our content type we have set up. We have movies. Um, we have this migration files we just ran. So we're adding the file uh, in Git. Uh, we have a new branch where we wanna remove the movies content type. So we're creating a migration file which we call h.js. Or oh, actually we're adding to Git, sorry. And this is very tiny code. This is uh, the update of the test. All right, let's commit things. Remove movie from content type, content model. Get status, yep, everything is clean. Let's push it into its own branch. All right, let's switch. All right, so, oops. Now we have a branch, we can make a pull request out of this branch. All right, and now CircleCI is kicked off, so we can check out CircleCI. All right, that takes a while to spin up. Checking out the code, just joined the cache, installing NPM and Python dependencies. All right, and now the migration is already running. It's running very fast. First, you can see that additional environment was created. And it ran the tests and the tests passed, even though the test before assumed this field was existing. So now we can merge things. And now if we check out the master build. So this assumes automatic deployments from the master branch to production. So going to master is going to production. If you have a separate production branch, you need to adjust accordingly. And if you use an external deployment service, obviously you run the code in that service and not as part of your CI flow. Yeah, so this is master. Running tests. Oh, sorry, this is the CI master that's running, okay. Um, two jobs in this workflow. Deployment is running two. CI doesn't make for great demos. <laughs> Just takes all very long. Um, but yeah, you see all these um, migrations are running, deploying to Heroku. And now it's actually gone. And if you, oops, that's refreshing here. And now you see the version tracking entry is updated to eight. So it doesn't just take care of running the migration, it also makes sure that the version information stays in sync. So the whole idea is integrate evolving your content model into your delivery pipeline. This is the best way to make sure you can actually test content model changes in isolation because it gives you a completely separate sandbox environment that doesn't affect production. Um, your editorial team, your marketing team can keep writing content, can keep adding to content, 
since the entire um, migration is programmatically, you can just apply it to the master space when you're ready to take it into production. Um, check out the example, we have it on GitHub. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Yes. All right, start uh, with one. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, first, when you start out with this, usually uh, I guess you have a contentful setup that's been around for a while. Uh, how do you create like the first, do you create like a first migration that is like the current state and then you create the second one or how do you? So the question was if you start out doing this, if you would create a first migration for the existing content model. Yeah. Um, you can but there's really no need to. Um, because when you create a new sandbox environment, it's always based on the master environment. You inherit the current content model. Since you probably don't have the history of all the changes made, you also don't gain anything from the Git history. Um, it's definitely possible um, when we start off with the migration CLI before we had environments, this was more of a problem because you would always start with a fresh space and how do I take my content model along? Um, but now with sandbox environments, you really don't need to. Mm -hmm. that uh, uh, you're building your uh, uh, CMS like internally as mm -hmm. a test and then you want to put it into production with a completely new environment then I guess you would want to have like mm -hmm. all of the content types that you so that would be if like if you work something as a proof of concept and then you want to take it or yeah, hand it over exactly. to a client hand it. So, Maybe yeah so yes I mean when you start a new green field it definitely makes sense to write migration files from the very beginning. But if you have an existing project that's already in production, um, I would argue there's no need to spend a lot of time. I, there's actually some tooling you can create the file automatically, um, but there's no need. It doesn't give you much because the migrations are a history. Once the migration has made it to master and beyond a point where you're probably not gonna revert it anymore, um, there's re it's just a historical artifact. It's just documentation at that point. Um, the, re the point is in the evolution in the branching model. Um, it's similar to like how often do you go into your Git history beyond like a week back and revert something. It doesn't really happen. You use it to Git blame, you use it to look at the log of a file, um, but you don't really revert things anymore. Um, you can, but it's not really what happens in practice. And the second question? Yeah, uh, can you lock changes from the, like in the web UI? We had this problem when I, like, I tried to introduce migrations, but mm -hmm. uh, it was hard to um, uh, like share the knowledge to everyone how to do it in time. So changes were made to the content models from the web UI and all of a sudden things weren't in sync. Can you lock so you can't make a content model uh, changes to the web UI? Question was, can you prevent people from making the changes to the web app? The answer was, yes, you can. Um, if you take away admin rights from them, um, or if you have customers and permission, take the manage the content model rights away, um, then it's no longer possible to make changes to the content model um, through the API or the web app. And then you need to create one all powerful user that actually can do it and store that user's access token on CI, on your CI system. Um, it, there's the exception that it definitely is possible to still make changes in an environment, but that's fine. Sometimes I just wanna really quickly try something, I don't wanna write the migration part yet, but you can't make changes anymore to the master environment. Yeah. Um, we're also gonna be um, we're working on some more features around environments to make them even more powerful, um, but right now you can just lock it down in master, so you, um, you can force your team to adopt the CI workflow uh, with one go. And then um, if you can't communicate in time, you might have very angry teammates, um, but they're not gonna mess up your content model. Uh, other questions? Yeah, Robin. I have a question about the API limits uh, okay. regarding migration tools. Mm -hmm. Is it the same or is, is it automatically handled? So if you hit your API limits. You mean the rate limit or you mean the- Yeah, exactly, rate yeah. limit for like writing content. Yeah, changes. yeah. Um, 
yeah, so it has a back of algorithm. And um, I think the, the usual rate limit is, I think, 10 requests per second. And I think the um, migration CI is code at most use eight per second. And if it hits a rate limit error, it backs off, waits a while to retry it. It's like incremental back off, and it has to be, I think, like four or five retries until it just bails out and fails. Um, it is a problem if you have, again, gigantic spaces. We have spaces with hundreds and thousands of entries. And many migrations don't involve many calls. Anything like adding fields, removing fields, um, is just one call. Um, it's just updating that content type with the new version. Um, if you do make a change um, that involves rewriting the content, you can do some quite powerful things with the migration uh, CLI where you take a content type which has 15 fields, you extract three fields into a separate content type, you create a link field in the first one to link to the new object, but deduplicate the ones based on the identity. You can do really crazy shit with this thing. Um, at that point, if you touch a content type that has, let's say, 100,000 entries, you might have a difficult day. Um, that probably involves shutting out the, um, the regular contributors for the day to just run the migration in peace. Um, otherwise, you're not going to complete it um, in a reasonable time frame. Um, so yes, you're still going to the normal rate limits, um, but it follows all the best practice in terms of incremental back off and um, being aware of the rate limits. Uh, which is, by the way, also a great place to steal the code if you ever want to do mass changes in code. Look in the migration CLI, how it does it. Just take that code and use it yourself. That one is better tested. Right. Anything else? If not, then you can always ask me afterwards and we take a 10 minute break. Um, you can quickly grab another beer, have a slice of pizza or take out the beer. Um, and then we're gonna keep going with Robin talking about UI extensions. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Compositeur finlandais. Er est un groupe de musique français originaire de Versailles formé en 1995, composé de Jean Benoît, Dunkel et de Nicolas Gobin. 
Erika Virgin est une chanson de l'artiste américaine Madonna qui figure sur son deuxième album du... Finlandais. Elle est un groupe de musique français originaire de Versailles formé en 1995 composé de Jean Benoît, Nocel et de Nicolas Gobin. Rika Virgin est une chanson de l'artiste américaine Madonna qui figure sur son deuxième album du...
Hände wollen zusammenkommen. Aber es fehlt ihnen das Herz dazu. Mittler zwischen Hirn und Händen muss das Herz sein. see if it's the live stream thing so uh, if you haven't heard that we are live stream this event so if you by any chance feel uncomfortable like asking questions on the live stream or something just you can come up afterwards and just so you know uh, okay so uh, my name is Robin uh, I worked at Futurus as a full stack developer for a little over a year uh, before that I come from DNA sequencing analysis of work uh, which I did for a few years before that uh, and today I'm gonna give a talk on getting started with UI extensions so I'm one of the people that has like learned something interesting and now I'm sharing it here uh, and I'll talk about how to build them uh, develop them how to make them fit into the overall like contentful editor uh, integrate some third-party API uh, configure them a little bit 
and just in general, like show you that it's pretty simple to get started doing this. <laughs> nice. Uh, so just to kind of like affirm my assumptions. So I guess ha has everyone in here worked with Contentful before? Okay, <laughs> hopefully, uh, <laughs> except the designer in the back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, and then also uh, have have. Who in here has done some more advanced stuff, like maybe building UI extensions, etc.? Okay, <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, <laughs> and I'm guessing we have a few front-end developers that might be aware of React and so on. Yeah. Okay. So, what got me sort of interested in diving deeper into UI extensions and learning about them uh, was that we were we are currently working on on uh, with this client that is based in the US. Uh, they are kind of involved in the education market and roughly their idea is to connect uh, universities and students. So like recruiting students to universities and helping students find the universities that, that fit them best. And they do this by having an editorial team that sort of publishes a lot of articles about different topics uh, and the back end then is, is contentful. So when they reached out to us, they talked a lot, uh, they had like a list of, of things that were bugging them from the, especially the editor's point of view, that were more familiar with like a more rigid like WordPress setup than a flexible contentful setup. And it was pretty clear when they came back to us and like, okay, well, we need help with maybe spell checking or a, or a more kind of like fixed editorial flow that UI extensions would fit right in there with like helping them bridge that gap. So from uh, kind of an overview tech, tech point of view, these uh, UI extensions replace parts of the editor experience uh, or extend it. And they do that by living inside of iframes that take, take up part of, of the editor. Inside of those iframes, you have an HTML5 app and you can build that however you want, just with JavaScript or with any like React, Vue, any other framework that you might want. Uh, if you do go with React, uh, Contentful has already prepared components uh, as part of a package called Forma 36 uh, that will make your sort of extension fit right into the editor without you doing the styling. Uh, when, what's more interesting is that you also get access to a UI extension SDK, which is kind of like a subset of, of the content management API, uh, which is already authenticated with the currently logged in user. So that sort of sets your scope of what you can do within the UI extension, which is pretty broad. Uh, you can also divide these UI extensions into three categories. Uh, the most basic one is the field UI extension. It basically replaces one of the fields that you have in your content model with whatever you want to put there. So you can imagine uh, kind of like enhancing one on a field with a, uh, an autocomplete from your third party or from your own APIs. Or you can maybe embed like a product catalog picker or something more like that. There's also the sidebar UI extensions. They live in the sidebar, have perhaps less to do with like managing the content itself, but you can imagine having a button that takes the current state of the entry and publish it, publishes it to, to a staging environment or something. And then there's the newest uh, type of UI extension, which is the entry UI extension. I haven't checked out that so much, but it's kind of the more ambitious, a more ambitious UI extension type that allows developers to completely customize the, the editor experience. But we're going to stick with the field UI extension. Uh, and what I'm going to try to build here is this type of thing. So you can imagine having a content model that is basically an article or a blog post or something. Uh, so we have a title, we have some body, and we have a description text. Uh, and we wanna, what we want to do is have a category field, a uh, category UI extension that sort of like takes this, uh, when you click this suggest button, it takes the description, passes it to an API, and it will predict the category that that description explains. So that's what we're going to try to build. And for that, we're going to use an API called Dandelion, 
I just Googled it. I haven't really used it in production or anything, uh, but it had a pretty decent API and it served the purpose for this demo. So it's basically a text analysis API. You can pass it to text string. It will do sentiment, sentiment analysis or like extracting data from, from uh, raw text. So uh, to get started, uh, Contentful has provided uh, a set of bootstrap scripts. Sorry, if I'm standing in the way. Um, so, and uh, what they do, if you've ever built like React applications, you have a set of scripts called create React app, and this works much the same way. So you run this, this uh, first line, and it will bootstrap a local development environment where you can develop your UI extensions. Uh, and what I've done here is I've run that command, uh, I've installed dependencies, installed additional dependencies so we can make HTTP, HTTP requests, um, and I've logged in and configured the, the kind of my environment. And basically what that does is it adds this file uh, where you store a content management token uh, and kind of like configure it to use the space that you want to use and the environment to deploy to. So then the scripts are able to like make changes to your content uh, or contentful environment. So now it's time for the demo. So uh, I have a content, uh, contentful space here, and here I have sort of the bootstrapped version of uh, uh, of the code. So this is basically the files that you're given to start with. <coughs> you have this uh, this file uh, that I showed before, uh, a set of other files that we're not gonna. Uh, do much with and then you have kind of a very simple a very kind of basic react setup where you have an index file with the entry point for kind of like your iframe some extra styling and then a react component so here is my root react component and there's some uh, contentful specific things that I will get to but uh, very basic like a React thing. So uh, here, to begin with, we have just a text input, which is imported from this Forma 36 library. Uh, and then we have some additional styling. So that's what we're starting with. And we're also getting the SDK uh, passed to us as a prop. So we do that here when we set up the, the component. So uh, what we're going to start with is to add some more Forma 36 components. So if you remember the picture that I showed, uh, we basically have an input and a button. So I import those and then I use them down here. So a text input and a button, uh, which currently don't do anything. But let's install them by running npm start. So this will set up a local uh, server for us to do development with. It will bundle everything, uh, all the assets, and it will install the extension into Contentful. So the first thing that we want to do when we have the Contentful space is we go to Extensions, and here you can see that it's been installed. So we don't really need to do anything here, uh, but instead we go to the content model that we want to modify, in this case the blog post, and we go into the field that we want to replace with our custom UI extension. Under appearance, we will see the custom extensions. So we just save that and save the model. And then we go to the content. I'm going to pick one of the articles. And here, it doesn't show up at all. And this is because we are running a local server on HTTP, which is not secure, but Contentful runs on HTTPS. So we need to first allow, and I apparently can't use this, uh, we need to tell Chrome that we need to trust this unsafe script. And then I will reload the tab, and now our extension will show up. Like that. So, uh, now at least we have it here. 
And if I get rid of this, uh, we can apply the next set of changes. So this is uh, <coughs> where you kind of like have to understand how to interact with React and Contentful SDK. So what we start by doing is fetching the values that were already in, as part of the, the content model. Uh, and we do those through the SDK uh, and store them in the Re React state. But then we also have to remember that there might be multiple people editing the same entry at the same time. So what we can do is subscribe to changes to both the description field and the category field and sync those back to the React state. So this is what we do here. This code comes with the bootstrap, uh, the bootstrap version of the UI extension. And then we just detach when we unmount the, the uh, components. So with that set up, it won't really change anything in the uh, in Contentful. So <clears throat> no, before I do this. Da, da, da. So if you have a look here at the components, it's sort of like squished together. So I want to add some spacing between them. For that, I'm writing just normal CSS. So I go to my styles. Styles, no. Uh, I go to my styles and I create uh, a new CSS class uh, and I add some bottom margin to my text field. Uh, and I use these special CSS variables that come with Contentful. And what I have to do in order to use these CSS variables is to import another uh, CSS file from Forma36 tokens. This, uh, uh, this package. And then I can use those uh, CSS variables. And then of course I add the, the class name to, to the component and this will, uh, this will add this uh, spacing between the comp these two components. And if I reload so that you can calculate the iframe height, uh, it will also show up in a nicer way. But still nothing happens, of course, if I try to click this button because the, if the click handler doesn't do anything. So now we can, if I can get to my, uh, we can integrate with our API. And what we first want to do is this API requires an API token and I don't want to put the API token into my source code. So I can tell Contentful to add an installation parameter to my UI extension. And I do this in the extension JSON file, which is here, that defines kind of the name, the ID of your extension, etc. And I can decide to put uh, installation parameters and instance parameters. So instance parameters would be like for every field that you want to replace, you can have parameters for each of those when installation is just globally for every space you install it into. So first I need to just reinstall it, the extension. And then when I go to my extensions and I click the extension, then I have to fill in this API token right here. So I'll click save, go to my content uh, and then I'll just go over this quickly. So basically what happens when you click the button is that we tell our component that we're loading something from external API. We're getting this uh, API token from the SDK. Uh, we pick up the description text so we can pass it. Uh, and then we send a request to Dandelion. And if we get any predicted category back, we replace that in our React component as well as updating our content, contentful SDK with that value as well. And if we don't get anything, then we just reset and remove the value from contentful. Uh, and then say that, okay, we're not loading anything anymore. So uh, if I now click this suggest button, it will take the description, pass it to the library, to the API, and then fetch back the, 
the category that was predicted. So then if I write something else like There you can see what that category predicts, and it's politics. Uh, so that was kind of a contrived example, maybe. But <clears throat> you can see kind of how you would be able to uh, call your own APIs and predict things, and uh, or maybe just have a, an API that suggests something, and you can still edit it if you want to. <clears throat> yes, so uh, that was it for kind of the, the demo part. So as a summary, uh, I really appreciate the developer experience that Contentful's UI extensions offers. You can still develop locally, uh, while at the same time inside of a real environment, like actually in Contentful in the, uh, in the editor, where you will see things later. Um, <clears throat> and also a note on the config values. So the config values are meant as configurations things. It's not a secret uh, stored vault or something. So if you store something very sensitive there, you have to be aware that those values are available in the iframe. So whoever has access to that iframe will also see those uh, installation parameters, like in clear text. Uh, and in this case, it's just a read access. Uh, so if someone steals it, we will hit the API limits and that's it. But if something is sensitive, then you shouldn't store it there. Uh, and then also the CSS variables. If you want to use them, uh, remember to, in, uh, to import this, uh, this CSS line first. Uh, and that's it. I've published the code for this uh, uh, online and open sourced it, uh, which kind of like, uh, so we have this uh, chili corn fund that sponsors us as futurist developers to work on open source tools. Uh, either like this, uh, my own kind of like projects or other projects that you might want to uh, kind of like uh, help out with and so on. And then you can get some compensations for work that you do outside of company time. So that's it. I'll, I guess I'll publish this in the meetup group if you want to get access to the code and check it out. Yep. That's it. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Yeah. I think that concludes the meetup. Sort of, you're free to stick around and have an extra beer or finish the pizza. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for showing up. Yeah.
Jiji Benu est un compositeur finlandais. Er est un groupe de musique français originaire de Versailles formé en 1995 composé de Jean Benoît, Nokel et de Nicolas Gobin. Lika Virgin est une chanson de l'artiste américaine Madonna qui figure sur son deuxième album du... Finlandais. Er est un groupe de musique français originaire de Versailles formé en 1995 composé de Jean Benoît, Nokel et de Nicolas Gobin. Lika Virgin est une chanson de l'artiste américaine Madonna qui figure sur son deuxième album du... 